And welcome back to Jeff Koinange live at the Intercontinental Hotel poolside, actually, during this festive season. Happy holidays to you all. On the bench today, an amazing, amazing young American woman with a story you need to read. In fact, she puts us to shame as Africans because she came all the way from Atlanta, Georgia to write a story and have a conversation with the Mao Mao general, a real one, before he died. Just published this book called The Boy Is Gone. Pick it up at Bookstop, Yaya Center. Go see my friend Chand. He'll hook you up. It's a great read, good Christmas present, and I tell you, great, great Kenyan history. Laura Lee Hutchinson, uh, Hutton back, rather, sorry. Don't worry. AKA Nkirote. Her Twitter handle is HHLL Huddenback. LL. Jeez, what's wrong with it? LL Huddenback. My Twitter handle is at Kunanga. Jeff, the hashtag, The Boy Is Gone, taken from the title of her very first novel. But it's not really your first, it is your first novel, but you've written before. When you were in Harare, you did a, um, a travelogue or whatever it was called, right? Just that I contributed to an anthology, a travel essay. What was yours called? Uh? Stuck in Bulawayo. Stuck in Bulawayo. Mm -hmm. Great town, by the way. It is a great love town. Love Bulawayo. I didn't spend much time there, but I loved it. Yeah. yeah. And I, um, when I was coming from that rural village that I told you about, yes. um, that I was just going to pass through there to catch a train, but the train was broken down or something. So um, the family where I was staying, they gave me a list of names to call of like friends and family in Bulawayo. And so I'm stuck at the bus station. I don't know what, what to do because the train's broken. I, I had torn out Zimbabwe from my Lonely Planet guide mm -hmm. because I didn't think I was going there. Um, and then I, didn't, I don't have a good sense of direction. So I wanted to go to Vic Falls and I didn't see that I had to go through Zimbabwe to get to Vic Falls. And um, so anyway, I wound up going to Zimbabwe and in Bulawayo, then I called this guy, his name was John, and just said, hi, my name is, is Laura. I was staying with your family and they gave me your name. They said you would help me. And, and they did. Yeah, he showed up and he thought I was a South African woman he met on a train. Um, and then he, I was the only one in the little like internet cafe and I was like, <laughs> he was like, how did you get my number? And um, so, but he wow. just like. Did you end up in Vic Falls? I did. Ah, yeah. Mosi Otunya, the smoke that thunders. That's what they call it. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah the locals. Okay. Mosi Otunya. It was, it was a cool. Incredible, huh? Yeah. Okay, so you're in America, mm -hmm. and this bug, the Meru bug, has bitten you, and you want to come back. Mm -hmm. How long did it take you to come back? About two years. So I got, you know, a job, a gym membership, all the comfortable American amenities yeah, and all of that. Yeah, yeah. And then um, took a travel writing course. And then that's when I really was like, OK, I, I want to do the story. Mm -hmm. And you set it up along the way, you, you know, to make sure the general was still alive and the people were still there and all mm -hmm. that. Yep. I and talked we, to Moredi, his, his last born son, and he was like, he checked with his dad and he said, you remember in Kirote? Because <laughs> um, I only spent three days with him the first time. And they called you in Kirote after three days? Yes. I got, a, I got a niece called Nkirote, by the way. Really? Yeah, yeah. I try to live up to the name. It's a beautiful name. It's a great and name, yeah, yeah. They told me it means generous. It means um, someone who makes a home easily anywhere and a good manager. So that's... Look at that. I try to live up to So it. the second time, did you take a matatu again? Uh, no, no, this time... <laughs> <laughs> Moredi picked me up um, from the Nairobi. Actually, he did his family, his wife and his children picked me up at the airport and had a big sign, welcome, or Kiribu Kenya and Kirote. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, I, yeah, I had a more comfortable yeah. um, return. So, so you end up in Meru, mm -hmm. in uh, what's it called again, this place? Um, his, his town was Mutunguru. Mutunguru. Uh -huh. And you spend, what, three months plus, uh, several months? Yes. Mm -hmm. With this man. Every day you're recording, every day you're. You, you're going through the process. Mm -hmm. the, the first day he sat down and he said, OK, tell me how we're going to do this. And I said, well, just start with your name, when you were born, and your brothers and sisters. Two and a half hours later, um, he spoke uninterrupted, and he had outlined his entire 87 years, like down to the most specific days. And it was a feat I don't think I could have accomplished in my own 26 years at the time. So wow. it was, it revealed a rich training in oral, oral history, oral yeah. tradition, yeah. and 
Um, he didn't learn to read and write until he was a teenager. So he got his history from visiting his elders, his Jojos and um, recording, you know, sitting with them. Yeah. And they, they couldn't read or write, but they could recite seven generations of family folklore. And so, um, you know, that first day I yeah. was, and at the end of two and a half hours, we had a lunch break and I thought we were done. I was exhausted. And I, I thought, surely this 87 year old man is tired too. And after lunch, he goes, okay, that was a nice break. I want to go to the forest now. I want to show you where we entered the first night during Mau Mau. And um, I was like, really? Wow. <laughs> and, and you know, I, as I was reading this book, um, I mean, there's so many familiar things because the names start sounding, or they sound so familiar. And you know, my, my family as well. I, I, I noticed that, you know, he mentions my family members in this and other people who fought. You know, the dead and came out. These are general China's incredible, incredible history, which, which, you know, if you've read other books, reference books, it all connects. And you're getting it from a source that's completely out of left wing. It's incredible. Mm -hmm, absolutely. It's incredible. And I wanted to preserve his voice and keep it his first person narrative. So actually, the book is structured. I'm only, as a narrator, I'm only in it for the introduction. Um, and kind of just explain how I met the general, set the non-African reader in a geographic, cultural, historical context, and then it's his words, his edited transcripts. Yeah. I came and, home, yeah. And even the name Mau Mau, which a lot of researchers have debated about for decades, it, he also explains what they thought the meaning was. Mm -hmm. You know, it was a uh, Uma Uma. Yeah, yeah, it was Uma Uma. It was a name just you know twisted around. Mm -hmm. Get out, out. Get, yeah, to get in Kikuyu, the... in Meru, it means mm -hmm. get out, get out. Uma Uma, Mao all Mao. The, all the European. I didn't take it personally. <laughs> <laughs> he, he wasn't telling you to leave anything. No, he wasn't. <laughs> but it's incredible. I mean, how long was he detained? He was detained for a year at Minyani. Um, he went but after there the, in the fighting. What year was he arrested? It, it, September 1955. He surrendered. He left the forest. Um, they were dropping leaflets in the forest and saying, you know, General Nkungi, if you leave, um, we, you won't have, you won't face any repercussions. You'll, you know, if you cooperate with us, then um, we'll accept you. And so he surrendered September 1955. And then he spent, uh, it looked like it was okay for a couple months in Meru. And then December 1955, he went to Minyani. Um, My dad was in Minyani. I see. Yes, wow. for several years. And then Manda Island. Where wow. they took all the bad boys, yeah, wow. yeah. That's Sabo, Manyani is Manyani's Sabo. Manyani's in Sabo, right. yeah, on the way to Mombasa, right off, right off the main road, my main highway. So if you escaped there, then you oh, would get... Oh, forget it. You'd be eaten, eaten by lions. Mm -hmm. It was deliberate. Mm -hmm. So was he a feared general? Was he... I guess he must have been by the British. I mean, he, they must have feared him, huh? He was pretty unique in that he was a school teacher, so he was literate, and by most measures, like, by most assessments of, of um, success. He was pretty, you know, he was literate, he, was, he had a job. Uh, he started dealing timber, which was illegal, yeah. but he walked in on some friends that were illiterate. They were counting their money from a timber sale, and he looked at it and he was like, I, I wouldn't get that much money in, in mm, years working mm. and teaching. So yeah. he got involved in the timber business, yeah. and that's kind of when he started breaking with the, the missionary school. Yeah. But mm -hmm. did, did he give you stories about how they would kill people? Would they, would they tell you that? So he, he would say they had a special force um, that, that that would kill the people, or, like that they would come into the forest and the code was take them to Kamadi. So if he gave the order to take someone to Kamadi, they would say take them to Kamadi. If this one will get trained with Kamadi, then they knew that it was like an execution on the yeah, way. Yeah. Usually, and so. mostly he was referring to the home guards, you know, the the Africans who were fighting for the, the British, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah. Exactly. Did he and ever meet the Kimathis, the General China? He, he didn't meet him. He said he only saw them, saw him in the picture. But he, because he was one of the few literate men in the forest, he was promoted to secretary pretty much immediately, maybe after two months. And so he attended most of the executive meetings. So he got a lot of stories from yeah, that yeah. too. What was the most enlightening thing about this book, uh, Laura? What, what was the most, the thing that you say, wow? I think that's a hard question because every, every session I had with him, I was surprised by something mm. he said. Um, let's see, Jojo Jessica, his wife, one of the most surprising things when I asked him, what, what, what is your most proud accomplishment? I expected him to say the Tisako or years of teaching or um, he said I, I married the right woman. Um, I chose the right partner and Jojo Jessica was the hardest working woman I've ever seen. Yeah. She was a, the best tea picker ever 
And the general, I asked the general, I said, what drew you to Jojo Jessica? And he said, the character of her father and also her mother. And he told this little story that her mother was, um, would sell bananas by the side of the road. And um, the general walked up to her little table one time. This is Jessica's mother. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, supposing I bought all of your bananas, what would you do? And she said, oh, I, I would go home to get more bananas and come back and sell the rest yeah. of the bananas. Uh, uh. And so Jessica <laughs> took that um, character and um, she didn't speak English, so uh, Mordedi would translate our sessions, but um, I really admired her. And I, I guess the most enlightening thing is just that um, people are people yeah. everywhere you go. And yeah. there's good ones and, and bad ones. And in one of our last interview sessions, I asked what I now realize was a stupid question. I asked him, um, do you think you're representative of Africans? And he looked at me and he said, okay, well, in Kirte, you're, you're an American lady um, and I'm African. He goes, are all, are all American ladies like you? And he said, no, not all Africans are like me. Not everyone comes to the point, to the extent of knowing that these are all men and these are all women and you take somebody as he is. Wow. And, um, that's deep. It wasn't a stupid question, that's deep. It, it might well. It was. It was a great answer, but yeah. probably a stupid question. I think anytime, yeah. like you always want to, like yeah. when someone's not who you're used to, you put a lot of pressure on minorities to mm. be representative yeah. when everyone's just acting as a person, sure. as an sure. individual human being. Sure. You know. You, a moment ago, you talked about uh, picking tea, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. His wife and and, and the, the people there, and they also made you pick tea, or you you. <laughs> kind of volunteered or whatever. That's right. The, after the first dinner with him at Texas, he said, tomorrow I want you to learn how to pick tea. So we go up, you know, seven bumpy miles off the paved road to the tea farm. Jojo Jessica's waiting outside with a big wicker basket. And we head to the fields and it's two leaves and a bud, right? That's right. So the, the Kenyan workers, when they're picking, it's like a blur. They're going so fast. But I really had to like find two <laughs> leaves and a bud and like snap it off and place it. I get their approval. They're like, okay. And put it in the bucket, in the basket and get another one. And so everyone kind of stops to watch and the general stands up tall and he goes, you are the best white worker we have ever seen. And I was like, oh, you know, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Like that, yeah. you know, how many other white workers have you seen? And he exactly. said, none, but you are very good. And so I, I still wow. was flattered, but. And you didn't feel strange, you know, blue eyed blonde in the middle of Africa. You didn't feel strange. I did for sure. <laughs> like, um, you know, I'm walking down the street, I would take a boda boda from, um, I stayed with his son's family, family, Kenua's family. And I would take a boda boda up. Even these people that had seen me, you know, for weeks there, they'd still mzungu, mzungu, mzungu. And um, so I've never been so aware of my skin color, like, because then, you know, I, as a white girl from Georgia, I never had to be in the minority. Wow. And wow. it got to the extent I was in a cafe in Nairobi and um, the waitress came over and because I was just so aware of, of my skin and my race. And um, she, she asked me, I ordered a coffee. She goes, do you want white coffee or black coffee? And I was like, <laughs> it extends to the coffee. <laughs> so I, I had crossed my arms and I, I in my uh, one, one woman protest. Yeah. So I say, I want a black coffee, <laughs> then I'm going to mess with her, right? <laughs> so she brings me a black coffee <laughs> and I was like, oh, can I have some milk and some sugar? She said, so you want white coffee? And I was like, yeah. I do want white yeah. coffee. That's what I want. <laughs> you were talking about another story where you took some time off and you went on a bit of a holiday with your mm -hmm. boyfriend, Robert, mm -hmm. and you drove up to uh, Isiolo Samburu, mm -hmm. right? And, and go and the Reverend or oh, that. Oh, that's right. Yeah. So we had, a, we had a mutual friend, Reverend Yaga. Mm -hmm. And um, so we were riding in the car and um, we had just entered Samburu and Kari, the general's daughter, was driving. And um, Jojo, Je Jojo Jessica had never seen an elephant before in her 80 years. And so the general said, I promised her, he really wanted me to see a lion. I've never seen a lion in Africa. And so we're driving along in, in Samburu and this Land Rover is approaching and it's a Land Rover full of, of white tourists. And Reverend Nyaga starts, you know, flagging them down out the window. So they slow down and, and they're like, uh, and, he, and he goes, and Kirote, greet your family. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, you want me to, I don't, and then I'm like, so I just awkwardly say, hello, he, and they, they were like, is there a problem? Right. Is everything okay? Uh -huh. I said, yeah, everything's fine. I just, 
wanted to greet you. Is your safari going well? You know, and, and they have like heavy accents. Yeah. They're from like Finland Correct. or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's I don't Scandinavian. Know. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. We have no connection. And then they finally drive off and Reverend Yaga is like, oh, it was a nice reunion. You know? <laughs> so, it was. Now you see how us black people feel when we're in America? <laughs> it's a good, yeah, you see so, how us black people feel? Yeah. My friend told me, oh, you did the minority nod. I'm like, oh, like <laughs> but it, it affects you. Yeah. You're like, yeah. you're so just, oh wow. my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to our world. Thank you. Kiro, I want to take another break. Come back. What a great story. The saddest part is the general never lived to see the publishing of this book, right? But he knew it was going to come out at some point. I came back in December. Tw oh. Hold the thought. Hold the thought. It's a great thought, and I, I want to talk about it when we come back. And uh, is the book available on Amazon? Mm -hmm. It is. Barnes & Noble, Amazon. Barnes & Noble. Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Mine's not available on Barnes & Noble. Is that? Right. Let's get it well. available. <laughs> <laughs> the book is called The Boy Is Gone. Conversations with the Mau Mau General. Please pick it up. Go to Yaya Center, upstairs bookstop. Go see my friend Chand. He'll get you a copy. You will not regret it. It's a great read and a great reference book. It's, it should be in universities too and high schools. Our stories written by us. And the other question I want to ask you is, why does it take a person all the way from America to come and tell us our story? Think you about that. Kid Ortez, Twitter handle is LL Huttenback. Spell it, yeah, Huttenback. Mine is at Queen Anger Jeff. The hashtag, the boy is gone. Jeff Kunanga live at the poolside of the Intercontinental takes another break. We'll be back in a moment. <laughs>